Yeah, good morning. Uh, welcome back to our Economics of Regulation course. Before we start, two things. First of all, please join me in WebEx. Uh, those of you who are not yet uh, in WebEx to give me feedback and uh, to ask for questions. And second, uh, probably or hopefully you saw this uh, offer for an internship by, by Deutsche Bahn. Uh, this is just an inter six month uh, internship at Deutsche Bahn, uh, which the, the department which ran, uh, manages the so called Rhine Alpine corridor, Rhine Alpen corridor from Rotterdam to, to Genua. And uh, this is rather interesting as the head of the department is Christiane Warnecke, who did her PhD at our chair and also took this uh, course here. So she uh, is well aware of what you are doing here. And uh, if you want to apply, uh, and uh, you can, can just uh, ask me as well, and ch or just uh, apply directly. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I want to start now with uh, the, the lecture, uh, with uh, lecture nine. You will see there is a long intro in the lecture anyway, so therefore I just start. And in the beginning, for the first two or three minutes, I put the subtitles on, then I again will remove them. Okay. Welcome back to our course on economics of regulation and our inquiry into the land of asymmetric information and mechanism design. Uh, in the last lecture, we discussed regulation under adverse selection, and we will move on uh, discussing this, topi uh, this topic and uh, look into some, some further advanced uh, questions. So just to give a brief refresher or review of what we did uh, uh, just in the last lecture, uh, we learned how a benevolent a regulator deals with the asymmetric information problem. So the regulated firm had private information about some of its characteristic. The regulator didn't know was it a high cost or a low margin cost firm. It didn't know about perhaps about the, uh, the demanded phase. It was it high or low uh, demand. And what we saw is that under certain circumstances, this asymmetric information was not socially costly uh, in the following sense. Even if the, if the regulator prescribes the full information uh, contracts, uh, the so-called incentive compatibility constraints of the firms would be satisfied and uh, we would really implement our full information of first best uh, outcome. Okay, uh, and uh, however, the, the problem is that, uh, okay, uh, just to get back here, that this, this holds in the case where we have these two Lewis, uh, different Lewis Zepping models in the one where we have uh, that fixed cost and marginal costs are unknown, but we know what the relation between uh, the two uh, variables is and in the other is uh, demand unknown. And what we saw is in these cases, under certain circumstances, and we will have a, a problem on that where you can calculate uh, the interval which has to uh, be satisfied so that the incentive compatibility constraints hold. So in, under these circumstances, uh, in the sense of full information outcome can also be realized under uh, asymmetric information. However, uh, in particular in the bear myelson setup where uh, just marginal costs are unknown, we don't know whether this firm faces a high or low marginal cost, uh, we saw that the full information outcome would not uh, lead to the revelation of the true type of the firm because the firm, that is the low type firm, would always have an incentive uh, to claim to be of a high type in order to earn a rent. And so the important point was that we saw that uh, in order to make the firm tell the truth, the regulator has to pay a rent to the firm. Uh, this firm is, however, costly because yeah, we know uh, alpha is smaller than one weight and so on. So here you see it's a rent, not the rank, as uh, Google mistakenly took it. And uh, so the way uh, the, the, the firm's profit or the firm's rent get in the social welfare function or uh, taxation is, is, is distorted and so on. So the point is, this is costly. That's why we distort also decision of uh, the high type in order to reduce a rent. That's what we did at some extent. We saw, however, that it's always optimal to uh, pay such an information rent because the social welfare is higher. Remember these small triangles we, we uh, had uh, because we increase the consumer surplus. Okay, uh, if we make the low type firm revealing its true type, because then consumers can get uh, the the uh, product at the low price, even though they have to pay some information. Okay, the question is, or what you might ask is, is there anything else the regulator could do in order to avoid these uh, rather not so nice situation as it has to pay both a socially costly rent and has to distort the price of the high cost type. And that's actually what we turn to now. What could the regulator do in, ad in addition? And again, we assume the bear myerson framework with a possible cost of high or low, uh, which is unknown or unobserved by the regulator. But what could the regulator do? The regulator could send an auditor 
to the firm, okay, Wirtschaftsprüfer. And the auditor then comes up uh, with some report and it tells you that it's a high, uh, that, that the cost of the firm are actually high or low. Uh, this uh, is what in here in formal terms can just be called a signal and it's a public signal because it's observed both by the regulator and by the by the regulated firm and uh, the, the auditor sends a report telling the, the regulator that uh, this company has either high or low cost. If it has low cost we get the signal SL, if it has high cost according to the auditor it has uh, uh, yeah, it, it gets SS, SH. Yeah, and the, the important point about these audits is that they typically are not perfect. Uh, that means that, and that's what's, what's illustrated here, even uh, if the firm is a low type, okay, actually, so this is what uh, this uh, notation means, even if the firm is a low type, uh, the probability that the signal is also low type is not one, but it's smaller than one, it's phi L. And therefore we have a converse probability that even though the firm is really low type, the auditor in its audit tells you that it's a high type. Okay, and that's just with one minus phi L. And what makes things probably even worse is that even if you're a high type firm, CH here, uh, under third probability, uh, the auditor thinks you are a low type firm and it gets, uh, it, it, uh, it, it uh, sends the signal that uh, SL, that the firm is a low type firm. That's phi H, okay? And of course, with the probability one minus phi H, uh, it sends the true signal in a sense. The important assumption here, however, is that uh, this signal is informative. What does that mean? Now, yeah, if you're a low type, the probability that uh, the, the auditor reveals truthfully or accordingly that you're a true type is phi L, and this is higher than phi H, the probability if, uh, that it reveals a low type if you're really high type. And you will see that's the very important point the regulator can use in order to even implement the first best. Okay, it should be clear, you get a signal, this signal is uh, noisy, so that is not always true, and uh, but however, it's informative in the sense that it's more likely to obtain a signal indicating a low cost firm if the firm is really low cost. The signal might still be very low, it might only be, phi L might only be 20%, but uh, it would then be higher than for the high type, it would be 10%, for instance, phi H. Okay, you can play around with any any percentages and that's actually what we are going to do in one of our, our problem sets in the tutorial class. Okay, so the important point here, our regulator or, or our, our signal is not perfect, but the regulator nevertheless can, and that's what, what the regulator really will do, can condition uh, the firm's contract, the firm's reward in this case, on its reported cost and the signal. Okay, and how that works, uh, we will look uh, into the next slide. Okay, and uh, an important assumption here for the very beginning is that we assume that a firm is risk neutral. We will later on in a, in a chapter on, on, on a moral hazard, we will discuss risk neutrality, risk aversion, risk uh, loving behavior in more detail, but for the moment just assume that we are uh, that the firm is risk neutral. And the important point is here, even though you get such a noisy signal, even though the signal is uh, not perfect, you will see that the full information outcome is possible. That's what I'm going to show you in the next few slides. Okay, so we move on. Uh, now, uh, the, what is, does a policy look like uh, if we want to obtain this full information outcome? So the point is, uh, the regulator asks the firm what its costs are. Then the firm announces some costs. And if it announces costs or CH, then the regulator sets a price uh, equal to, to uh, uh, CH. So PA, P will, PH will then be equal to, to CH. Uh, and then uh, it pays a transfer. Actually, this transfer might also be negative. And the transfer uh, is conditioned both on the reported cost and on the signal, okay? And here this notation with these two subscripts is here, TIJ, the I means just uh, that uh, the, the firm reported costs of CI and uh, the signal was CJ. So, and here in the next slide, we will uh, see that again, what this means. Uh, so, of course, we always have to check uh, about the, the uh, incentive compatibility constraint and the participation constraint. That uh, is what will be important. And in order to, to look into these constraints, of course, we have to uh, look what the, uh, the, the respective rents are given uh, these expected, uh, given these, these contracts and the prices. So what is the expected profit uh, or age of a age type firm from receiving transfer THL or actually the expected profit is here the following, if it receives a transfer THL, if the signal is L, uh, SL and, and THH if the signal is SH. So THL would just mean here, the H means that uh, the, the firm reported 
uh, the, the firm reported that it's a high type and the auditor sent the signal, no, no, it's, it's a low type, okay? And it might also be that if it's, re if it's reported that it's a high type, uh, that, that uh, the signal is also high. And of course here, uh, this is now a true for reporting. Nevertheless, you see that even though you report truthfully, you get this uh, pro problem or probability that the, the, the auditor sends the wrong signal. Okay, and that should be then clear, hopefully. RH, uh, with some probability phi H, that's what we just uh, defined uh, as denoting the probability that you get, a, that the auditor tells you this is a low cost firm, even though it's really a high cost firm. Okay, here we start with the high type. So phi H is a probability that, uh, the auditor gives the wrong statement. It's, it tells you it's a low-cost firm, even though it's a high-cost firm. In this instance, with probability phi h, uh, you receive this transfer, and you will see probably it's negative. And with the converse probability 1 minus phi h, uh, you receive the transfer uh, where, okay, you are a high type, and the, the, the auditor uh, correctly revealed that you're a high type. And of course, you have this f. Okay, now the point is, you see why this is an expected profit, because with a certain probability, you get the, the one uh, 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 transfer, and with the converse probability, you get the other. And it's a simple uh, expected value, okay? Then, uh, the, in order to check the incentive compatibility constraint, we have to look into, in a sense, uh, the gain from cheating for the low type. And here, the expected profit R bar L, uh, so crossed out L here, uh, uh, or cross out R here of the L type is a profit from misreporting, okay? Misreporting. Uh, and of course, we want to prevent that. So the, this uh, brand from misreporting of the L type uh, is very similar. What you see here, now we have a transfer we pay, which is THL. So it reported H, but it received uh, the, the signal was L. So here's actually, you see, it's the very same uh, exp uh, exp uh, expression as up there, okay? If uh, you report H and the signal is L, you get a certain uh, uh, transfer, okay? The point is here, however, and here it's where it's very important that the signal is informative, uh, the low type, if it's really a low type, has a higher chance uh, that this, uh, the, 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 the auditor uh, reveals really that's a low type, okay? This phi L, remember, it was greater than uh, phi H. With the converse probability, and therefore with a lower probability, uh, it has uh, told the regulator that it's a high type, even though it's a low type, and uh, the, the auditor wrongly, uh, the wrongly uh, states that it's a high type. Okay, and of course, if you misrepresent uh, your cost, if you say you're a high type, your price will be pH. Okay, and so this is nothing else here than, than pH. And of course, you have then, as always, our rectangle. Okay, uh, you uh, produce quantity Q of CH, which, because this is a respective price, and you get on each unit, you get a profit of CH, the price minus your own cost, which would be CL. And of course, you have, you have here uh, to cover also the fixed cost. Yeah, and what, what we will see now here is that in order to implement the first best, okay, uh, that is transfer of zero uh, and, and, and first best prices, uh, not transfer, but rent of zero and first best prices, uh, we have to construct transfers, THL and THH, such that first of all, the participation constraint for the high type is guaranteed. That means RH is greater or equal uh, than zero. And the incentive compatibility constraint of the low type is also uh, guaranteed, meaning that it cannot gain from, from, uh, from cheating, from misreporting its cost, so that R bar, the rent from cheating, uh, is negative. Okay, and that's what we are going to show next because it's uh, rather straightforward, as you will we'll see, uh, given that you have now only two conditions, RH and R bar L, uh, which has to be satisfied, and you have two instruments, THL and THH, and you will see how we can now uh, look in or how we can satisfy or how we can produce a first best as long as the signal is informative and phi l the probability that uh, it uh, that a uh, low type is truthfully revealed is higher than the probability that uh, a high type is misrepresented as a low type or mistaken as a low type from uh, or by the by the auditor okay so what we have to do next is just to look into these two conditions here i could call them one and two but i didn't in the next slide but uh, i just uh, just uh, reproduce it. So, and again, we can all do that in terms of our diagram where we just put our two uh, transfers here on the axis. And our first condition, our actually just ICC, okay, that was the incentive compatibility constraint. I just rearranged uh, this condition from the previous page uh, and solved for, okay, so here that's that's what you see. I, I just solved for, uh, for, for THL. So it's supposed to be, as always, I was too quick. Uh, and 
I just solve this here for zero, put the THL on the other side, and you'll see the file then gets into the uh, denominator. And that's what we have here. Okay. Okay, now what we see here, of course, we can immediately uh, draw this uh, line. It's just a, a straight line with a slope of minus one, uh, minus one minus phi L over phi L. Okay, and uh, here the axis intersection is this expression here. This is only important once we look into our second condition. And the second condition, uh, which is done the very same way, uh, the, 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 the intercept on the y-axis, uh, we just get by setting th, uh, THH equal to zero. And so you see the intercept is F, F over, over phi H, okay? And F over phi H, hopefully now, now we have it here, F over phi H, this uh, is really uh, or is obviously greater than uh, the intercept of uh, here the inter of, of the uh, incentive compatibility constraint here uh, of this locus and th this is obvious because here here you have something which which is minus and phi h is, is smaller than phi l so you uh, divide by something which is smaller therefore the the term is is uh, larger and the important point here note that and i have too many Lines here already. Note that the slope here of this R H of this R H equals zero locus is one minus phi H over phi H. Actually, it's minus one minus phi H over phi H. As phi H is smaller than phi L, uh, this uh, green line has to be steeper than than the red one line. So what we know here, actually, and that's an important point, is that the two in, uh, two lines intersect somewhere. Okay, and you will see that means that uh, we can implement a full information outcome because now we can look into uh, under what's or what what are the combinations of the two transfers which guarantee the incentive compatibility constraint that is which guarantee that R bar L is smaller than zero and this is simply all this shaded area here because all the uh, or, or all the area below uh, this, this red line. Because if you have a given THH and you get a smaller THL, then uh, which is necessary to get a R bar uh, L equal to zero, of course, then you will end up somewhere uh, below uh, this curve. So if this THH uh, is, is your value, and then this makes it, uh, this THL uh, would make it that you have uh, uh, R bar L equal to zero. If you reduce that, of course, you have a lower rent. Okay. So all these, uh, in this range, in this uh, gray range here, all the points are where the incentive compatibility constraint is satisfied. At the same time, at all points above the green line, our H would be greater than zero, okay? By the same, by the same logic. And so what we have to look into is just, uh, just draw an arrow here, uh, the, uh, at, at points where we are on, on, the, on the green line, and at the same time, because there our H is equal to zero, and at the same time, we are below the, the uh, red line, okay? And that's where you get the first best transfers. This is this, this uh, black line. So we have, of course, infinitely many potential solutions here uh, because you can just increase THH. Uh, and if you decrease THL, then uh, you get the same expected problem. The point is here, however, we have our wonderful result that we get the first best transfers. Okay, where we get the first best outcome here. We get price equal marginal cost and rent equal to zero given these transfers. Okay? And... Uh, what you will see here, how these transfers look like, before I go to the extensions here, uh, what these uh, transfers look like, uh, the point is you pay something like uh, a reward if it tells, turns out that you really, you told the, the firm uh, or you told the regulator that you're a high cost firm and the auditor also uh, uh, then confirms this, then you get something like a bonus. On the other side, uh, you are punished, and here you see you're in a negative territory typically, uh, and that's what you also will see in in, in or you might be in a negative territory if you uh, we do not consider f, of course, the fixed cost. Uh, and uh, the, the the point is here: uh, you have then this this punishment in a sense. Okay, uh, if you tell the regulator you're a high type, and uh, the auditor tells the regulator you're a low type. And uh, you will see in our in our problem set or in our problem that it's really straightforward to calculate in part or these these first best solutions. And what I ask you in in the uh, in, the, in the lecture or, or in the tutorial class in a problem is that you uh, calculate exactly this intersection point, okay? Because this is, in a sense, the minimal transfers uh, you have to, to pay, okay? 
Yeah, that's it. So, and this is a very general story here uh, because you see if you have uh, some signal which is not perfect, some information with a certain probability, and you can, uh, or you have uh, risk neutral agents, you can set up uh, in a sense, your positive and negative transfers, your rewards and benefits, uh, rewards and, and punishments, in a sense that you can implement the first best. And uh, what about phi L? If the auditor gets better, if you get a better signal, then it's very straightforward because then the, the slope of the red line becomes less steep uh, in, in the limit. Uh, if if uh, this is a true signal, this would be just a horizontal line here. Okay, it would be something like a horizontal line. The axis uh, uh, intersection would be different, but it would be a horizontal line, and it's uh, very easy what you have to pay. Okay, uh, you just would uh, have a transfer equal here uh, to uh, the, the rent. They, they would just have to pay the rent they would earn if they're a low time. Okay, uh, the problem here is, however, uh, of course, what you see is. Uh, even if you have a, a high type firm, it might turn out that this high type firm is punished. So it makes losses. This is not a problem for a, a risk a neutral firm, uh, which uh, has unlimited uh, access to, to, to funds. Uh, but the point is, uh, in, in some cases, you might have a limited ability to punish the firm. That is here uh, that it cannot cover any losses. OK, uh, we will get uh, back to that uh, in the more hazard case where we consider in more detail uh, the, the, the problem of uh, limited liability. OK, so here you really uh, it really turns out that you make losses under certain circumstances, okay? Just because you get a, a wrong signal. And uh, of course, you're compensated by uh, getting a high bonus if this, you get the right signal. And for uh, someone who is risk averse, uh, excuse me, risk neutral, it just doesn't matter if uh, the two end up with uh, giving you a profit of zero, you're happy, uh, satisfied, okay? The other point is if you have risk aversion, then you also have some limitability, limited ability uh, to to punish the firm because it gets very costly to punish it. It won't accept uh, very uh, strong punishment, for instance. OK, but we will also get back uh, to that uh, in the more has a case. Uh, finally, of course, you might think, oh, these, these guys, uh, these auditors are so well paid. How can we assume that they are costless? We could also introduce costly audits. Then you would just uh, do fewer audits, in, in a sense, and make the punishment higher. Uh, that's what you could do. Uh, and uh, in the other way, you might also uh, get something like a little bit of, of uh, bear myers and some distortion here. OK, uh, so yeah. So the, so the point is, if you have unlimited ability to punish, a very small probability is sufficient uh, so in order to reveal, reveal the true type, because you can then send or set the punishment very high. OK? Well, that's a little bit like a, a very crude logic. Uh, if you have uh, uh, no, no, no police, only a few uh, policemen, so it's very likely uh, that if you commit a crime, you're not co covered. But you have a very small uh, probability that, that you're caught. OK? that you're caught, then if you have a very extreme punishment, the idea is if you're risk neutral that you would never uh, commit a crime. Okay? Uh, we know that this logic doesn't uh, work in, in reality, but here at least it's, it's a nice logic in, in, in theory. Of course, we always will have some, some uh, kind of limitability, limited ability to punish, but uh, at least uh, it gives you some indication how it could. Next. Okay, uh, make a short break here because I think we start now with the next uh, topic and just ask uh, for questions in, in, in WebEx. Okay, after we uh, discovered some problems that I'm mute, that I had some tapping technical problems in uh, WebEx, we move on with our next topic with, with Capture. You will see we will discuss a lot about politics and the revolving door. Topic, Capture. Oh. I think I can move on and uh, capture is, is really an interesting topic right now. Uh, if you read the newspapers currently every day, uh, you have some news about these uh, Philip Amto, I think is, is called his name, this this politician from 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 uh, the Christian Democrats who received obviously some lobbying payment. And the question is, did this company capture him and did he do something uh, which was not in the interest of, say, uh, the electorate, uh, of the people who voted for him, but uh, for, for this company. And uh, the very similar problem might arise for a re by a regulator. Okay, So the regulator might not be benevolent, that is, maximize social welfare, but maximize uh, his or her own income. Okay, Might maximize uh, his or 
uh, her own income uh, and how could she or he do that now just accept bribes from the regulated companies uh, bribes often have uh, the 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 form of say you get offered a good job after your tenure tenure expires uh, so in in the context of regulation here uh, we speak of the so-called revolving door I think I somewhere I have this in my lecture, but here revolving door that lead to what does this mean here? Uh, you know that uh, you are currently a German uh, chancellor, and there is some infrastructure project uh, we 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 uh, could do, and then under your tenure you implement it, and afterwards you get on the board of this company uh, who really builds that infrastructure. And we had several cases. Oh, this is not for no no the completely fictional uh, example. We had several cases where, for instance, a EU com commissioner uh, responsible for, for, for telecom regulation became afterwards uh, or uh, got afterwards on the board of, I think, Telefonica, one of the largest uh, European telecom companies. OK, and you might really think uh, in, in his decisions, uh, was he really acting on behalf of, say, total welfare, or was he already doing something uh, in favor of this company? So the point is here, the firm might attempt to bribe the regulator to, in our setup here of Bear Meyerson, to conceal damaging information. What does that mean, uh, damaging information? Yeah, if the regulator knows this is a really, this is a low type firm, uh, uh, and the regulator could just say, uh, it's a high type firm, then the, the, then the firm would earn a rent, okay? And if it knows it's a low type firm, of course, it would not uh, earn a rent. Yeah, a benevolent, suppose uh, there is another uh, uh, layer in the government. Uh, so, of course, the regulator is also part of the government typically, but at the lower level and suppose there's an upper uh, level uh, and, and there you have some benevolent uh, politicians or whatever. And uh, so what the benevolent government might do is it might give the regulator an explicit incentive to reveal this information. OK, it might pay uh, the, the regulator a bonus if it reveals a certain information. Actually, at the end uh, of this uh, small section, you will see I have uh, a few uh, references. And one is that uh, in India, there are environmental uh, inspectors and uh, they are typically, as you will see, have been bribed by companies, by, by uh, plant owners uh, to uh, write a report that this plant uh, complies with all the environmental uh, regulations. Okay, uh, and obviously they have been been bribed. At least in this experiment, they did because as as soon as uh, they did this, uh, as as these researchers did the experiment, so where they paid a bonus uh, to these inspectors, uh, the number of uh, reports which showed then that uh, these uh, companies did not comply uh, with the environmental uh, rules, but uh, had emissions far above. Uh, the, the thresholds uh, increase drastically, okay? And here you see that really a bonus could be paid or is actually paid in, in reality. So here, and, and just look into how we can solve this. Again, uh, assume a bear Meyerson model with a certain probability of the low cost outcome phi. And now the point is that the regulator has a certain information or a probability that it gets a certain information. Uh, so it, the, we wouldn't have a problem if, uh, everything were certain, okay? Uh, and here it's not certain, uh, so only with a certain probability, uh, xi or xi, however, or xi, however that's pronounced in, in English, uh, the regulator uh, obtains hard information that costs are indeed low. And uh, here is just some conditional probability. Uh, I don't want to go into details here. Uh, the probability that the cost is low given the regulator is uninformed here uh, is just this you get it from 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 base rule uh, just a conditional probability here in a numerator you have the probability that of course the cost has to be low and the probability is uh, phi and the regulator has to be uninformed uh, the, and the probability is one minus phi so this is just the probability that uh, the regulator is uninformed and so this is just a unit uninformed and cost is low and in the denominator in the denominator you see i think it's the intersection but uh... <laughs> It's a Schnittmenge in German, so I still have to work on that. Hopefully it's, it's clear uh, nevertheless. And so this is just a unit uninformed and cost is low. And in the, in the denominator, you have the probability that the regulator is uninformed and the regulator is informed, can only be informed if really uh, the, the firm is low cost so the probably uh, so we have to have phi and it uh, has this oh i don't know whether this is a xi but uh, 
it's supposed to be one, uh, and, and it has got this hard information. So this is a probability that it's informed, and of course, one minus this expression is just the probability that it's uninformed. So that's what we get. And the important point is that now we get a lower information that uh, cost is low, or uh, and the uh, we do not know it. Okay. Uh, still, of course, the probability that we have a low type is phi, but now the probability that it's low and we are not informed is is lower. Okay, so and you will see that reduces that reduces uh, the potential rent of the firm, because uh, in, in, in the in the other part here, this difference between phi u and phi, uh, you get this information of the regulator. And of course, here, uh, if the regulator, so what can the government do? If the regulator admits to being uh, informed, the low cost firm is just regulated according to full information policy. Okay, you know it's a low firm. If the regulator claims to be uninformed, the government does not know whether this is true or not. Uh, and it just uh, then uh, pays a regulator, okay, a, a bonus. If uh, the regulator admits uh, to be informed. And uh, so suppose that this is large enough so that the regulator is truthful. Uh, that's what we saw in this Indian example, uh, and in, in, there's another example from Mexico where uh, people uh, who go with their cars uh, to, uh, we, we would say, uh, to the emission test, uh, whereas often if they have an old car which doesn't uh, meet the criteria, they just pay uh, some $20 bribe to, to the mechanic, and then he puts another uh, car uh, which meets the threshold on, on uh, or into this uh, device and then produces some, uh, some oh, whatever plaquette is in, in English, so, so some label, okay? Uh, and here it's 20 euro or $20 we get from as a bribe, so you have to pay them probably 25 or something like that. Okay, now uh, when the regulator is uninformed, high cost price uh, is PH, the rent of the low cost firm is as always, okay? Uh, that's our standard bear Meyerson. And now suppose that it uh, costs the firm uh, one plus theta uh, to increase regulator's euro uh, income by, by one euro. Well, this just means that it's uh, expensive to set up Swiss bank accounts, okay, if you want to bribe someone. And uh, what the government must ensure, and that's what I want you to, to understand here, is the following condition. Given pH, the price of the high type, this would be the rent of uh, the low type, okay? And this is, at the same time, the maximum it would be willing uh, to pay or to bribe to the regulator. Okay, because uh, if it has to pay that, it's not better off. But if it has to pay a little bit less, uh, it gets some rent. So this is a maximum. And if S is a bonus, you uh, uh, and and of course one plus theta is is uh, again uh, the, the 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 cost of transferring one euro. Uh, so you just have to de divide it here by one plus uh, plus theta in order to get the necessary bonus. So that what does this mean here? Necessary bonus now. Uh, the you the government pays uh, the 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 regulator more than the firm would ever do okay so here you see the cynical uh, economist uh, the regulator is only honest if you pay uh, her more or him more than uh, the firm would do okay yeah now the point is if this payment is to the regulator is socially costly like uh, you don't uh, value these bonuses so highly uh, as consumer surplus and taxpayers money because in a sense, the government has to bribe uh, the, the regulator. Uh, the optimal policy is uh, to set pH then even higher than the usual uh, BM policy. Uh, but uh, the point is that at the same time, the probability is lower. And you reduce the rent of the low cost firm and you reduce the required payment to the regulator to reject bribes. The, the important result here is that uh, compared to the case where the regulator is benevolent, the regulatory uh, policy is distorted further to reduce the firm's benefit. Okay, and it actually turns out that the firm is made worse off uh, as we have this further distortion. Okay, at the same time, we also have a higher probability uh, that, that its type is, is discovered. Okay, but here the point is, uh, if in a sense you have an upper layer of government, which ensures that the lower layers are truthfully uh, reporting these types, the firms are made worse off. Okay, and in the notes I already mentioned uh, or alluded to that, uh, I have many, or we have many examples where uh, you get uh, uh, these, these problems here. Uh, these uh, these uh, article by Esther Duflo and and co-authors uh, is exactly this Indian example uh, where you have environmental inspectors which obviously receive uh, receive uh, some bribes so that they uh, write reports according to that uh, the 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 plants comply with the in, uh, environmental regulations. Okay and. Uh, I just want to look here. Yeah, 
the, the point is that uh, if you get some incentives for these auditors, uh, it can improve their rec re reporting and make regulation then more effective because it's just not sufficient to, to have uh, uh, or to enact some laws uh, when at the same time uh, you get false reports uh, due to these bribes. Okay, and this I also mentioned this a paper by Paulina Oliver uh, from the Journal of Political Economy about the environmental or emission regulation in, in Mexico City. Okay, just uh, look into that. That's a rather uh, interesting case study where it shows that uh, cheating involves uh, bribing center technicians. Okay. And you have to, you as a government, as an interested government, have to, in a sense, pay a bonus in order to solve that. Before I move on uh, to the next point, uh, I make a short break here and ask for questions. Okay, the same here. I want to make a short break. So, of course, it all depends on that you have an upper layer of government which wants to make sure that the lower levels uh, of the government, these like these regulators, don't get. Uh, bribed or, or not corrupted. So uh, in the end, of course, uh, it's not clear whether the politicians up there should be much uh, better in terms of uh, pursuing the uh, total welfare. Of course, then in the end, it's just a democracy and election. So you want to get rid of or you could get rid of, of, of say, a corrupt politician. Actually, uh, there is a huge discussion about transparency rules for, for members of German parliament, of Bundestag and so on, about Nebentätigkeit, so about some income they get from, from companies or something like that. Uh, the, the problem is, of course, here with the revolving door, even though you have some transparency rules right now, uh, it doesn't help you. Uh, you. You don't know whether they got some offer of once they are out of parliament. Okay, that's why something like cooling off periods have been uh, introduced. Okay, so we might uh, move on discussing that uh, in in Webex a short break right now. Okay, we move on. Okay, the last topic uh, of these advanced topics on adverse selection concerns dynamics and commitment. Uh, you already saw that regulation is typically a multi-period framework. Just remember German incentive regulation in, in energy and electric, electricity and gas, you have five-year regulatory periods. Uh, that's so similar to what you have in many uh, network industries in uh, the United Kingdom, for instance. Uh, in telecoms regulation, for some time, you had only 18 months uh, regulatory periods. Now it's more like three years. And uh, the point is here in this uh, in this multi-period framework, what we already learned when we discussed uh, cost uh, or rate of return regulation, cost of service regulation, we saw that if you have such a base year in the next year, if you have a re-evaluation after, say, five years, you have what is called a ratchet. Okay, I just can write it down here. You have what is called a ratchet. That is, a firm knows that if it has low cost in year four, uh, the regulator will prescribe low costs in year five, six, and seven as well. Okay, so what this means is, that uh, if you really reduce the cost in the next period uh, or, or in, in the next year, uh, you have to live with that uh, once the regulator learns it. And therefore, this gives you an incentive not to reduce the cost in year four, say, once if, if you have a re-evaluation in year five, but only in year six, so that you have uh, to keep this cost uh, advantage in a sense at least for four years. So that's, that's a problem in dynamics. And we use here now a slightly different just a small comment in German, this is called a Photojahr effect. Okay, uh, if you once uh, happen to hear uh, the president of the Federal Network Agency, uh, Mr. Hohmann, uh, he might talk you more about this Photojahr effect. Uh, a problem where uh, we look into the, the Bear Myerson problem and look into uh, what what this means in terms of a regulator and in terms of revelation of the type. Because you know, if you're, for instance, in a two, two, two period world, if you reveal your type in, after one period, uh, in the next period, your type is known. And uh, even though you could get an information rent in period one, you don't get any in period two. Okay? And you will see uh, that might lead you just to also uh, cheat in period one, because then you can still get uh, uh, in, uh, information rent in, in period two. So the problem here, in our stat static setup, in our one period setup, was that the low cost firms have rents and they are probably uh, have to be considered excessive, and high cost firms have distorted prices upwards. Okay? 
And uh, so now we look into uh, three different cases. First, full commitment, second, renegotiation, and third, no commitment. So full commitment just means that a regulator commits to long-term contracts. That is, if you have two periods and then the world is over, it commits right now uh, for the prices in the two periods. The second is you allow uh, renegotiation. What does that mean? The regulator can only modify the long-term contract if the firm agrees, and there is no danger of expropriation. And Pareto gains are always implemented, that is, a high cost a firm's prices are set according to cost. This will become much clearer once we look into example. Uh, but here I just want to give you a real-world example. Just uh, think, for instance, of the Berliner Wasserbetrieb. So Berlin uh, uh, privatized Partially, it, it's water company, I think, in 1999. It sold about 49% to RWE, RWE and, and to, I think it was Veolia or Vivendi, uh, it changed its name, uh, and, uh, at that time. Okay? But then there was uh, some public discussion and there was, uh, oh, however, folks uh, enjoyed, it's called in English, some, some ballot here, uh, and, and uh, Berlin people wanted to have their water back, in a sense. Okay? We wanted to have the water uh, company back, and uh, that means that they had to, uh, or to, to uh, pay out, in a sense, or buy back uh, the water uh, or the shares from RWE. So Berlin had to buy back the shares from RWE and, uh, and Vivendi. And uh, the, the point is, uh, here you had renegotiation because you had an arbitrator. Okay, you had some arbitration, and uh, I think uh, the, the, the the companies were not really expropriated, but we just got back what the value of the, the, the assets were. On the other side, if you uh, if you look into no commitment, uh, I always call this the uh, Hugo Chavez. Uh, uh, kind of, of policy in Venezuela if you were a foreign investor and it turned out that you really got uh, uh, could make profit after you uh, invested, uh, you could have uh, just been expropriated and thrown out of the country. Uh, I don't know how well it fits, but in Russia there were uh, two cases uh, in the beginning of the years 2000 uh, where Shell and, and I think also BP had to had first bought some shares in, I think it's uh, one, one case was the Sakhalin oil field. They had bought shares there or, or uh, a project there and uh, they had to sell on due to pressure of, of Russian politics, uh, they had to sell stakes below the market value, at least that's what the OECD said, uh, had to sell stakes below the market value back to Gazprom. Okay. Another point is, is Allianz, they invested in, in Gasland, uh, Gasland, the Norwegian pipeline network, and uh, uh, this was in 2011, and after two years, once they invested, uh, Norwegian government reduced the regulated uh, tariffs by 90%, and this, this cost Allianz, for instance, a lot of money. So here, these are highly uh, important points and the point, and they will be even more important in terms of when we come to investment, because of course the point here is only about whether you reveal your information or not. Uh, but uh, very often you have an investment project and you will only invest if you're certain that you're not, not expropriated later on, okay? That uh, your assets are not taken away. And you will see that this is really in particular for many, 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 uh, uh, developing countries a huge problem and here's what you see that just some evidence from Latin America where uh, renegotiation takes place in, in almost all infrastructure uh, infrastructure sectors and uh, at a high frequency okay yeah uh, so just to give you the, the basic insights which are given that we have our model rather straightforward as I hope to to uh, convince you. Again, bear Myerson, but now for two year, uh, two periods, and we have some doubt, discount uh, factor here. Uh, and, uh, and the full commitment, of course, the optimal policy static uh, bear Myerson policy repeated for two periods. You will see that uh, in, in, in uh, a minute you cannot do better. Uh, and from the firm's choice of contract in the first period, that's however the problem. Uh, the regulator knows for sure uh, that the fir what the firm's costs are in the second period, and that's what tempts the regulator, okay? You know this is a low-cost firm, so why should you pay a rent in particular? Why should you uh, uh, distort the price of the high-cost firm, as you already know it's a high-cost firm and not a low-cost firm, okay? And uh, again, we can just look into this case. I just uh, need to jump down, hopefully, somewhere my diagram comes, because that's what we have here, okay? Uh, the point is here, this is the standard bear myosin in period one. Okay, uh, the, the, suppose you have separating contracts in the first period, so you pay this rent, okay? And the re regulator commits to the second period rents, but not how these uh, rents are, are 
generated, so how it's paid, okay? Uh, and suppose you have some second period rent for the type I firm. Uh, the, the point now is here that, and that's what we show here, in a, in a uh, first period, actually, you get, oh, and I should have shown you that, this is, the green area is the standard bear myers rent, okay? But in the sense, in the second period, you know that price will be set according to marginal cost of the high type, okay? And now this is already all we have to know because you know in the second period, it's uh, if you claim in the first period that you're a high type, you receive the green area as a rent if you're really low type. In the second period then, uh, you would receive this as a rent because now the regulator assumes that you are really a high type and therefore uh, prescribes price CH and you would earn this rent. And now the point is you only tell the truth if you receive in the first period uh, this, this green as a rent and in the second, and that's why I have to jump down, this red part, okay? Because here, and that's what was written here in this bullet point, in the second period contracts will have efficient prices and transfer which delivers a promised rent. And if you have these prices, you only tell the truth if you get this red rectangle, okay? That's all we have. Th th that's all we have and that's already done that, okay? And I think uh, here, and I don't want to, to uh, go through the details here because that's what we uh, discussed in some length in a problem in the tutorial class. So what is your rent? Or, or actually your rent has to be larger than here. This is uh, your rent in the first period. This is a green rectangle, okay, we previously had. Again, the price is, is distorted here in the first period. Uh, oh, and of course here, because this is pH, uh, of course here, uh, TH, would would uh, the the of course here th would include something like ph minus ch times uh, q of ph as uh, a tax to the firm okay and that's why we we end up here so as always this would be your rectangle and it would in the first period be uh, times the low output okay this would be the green rectangle if you remember that and in the second period here uh, the the price would be this here. And of course, uh, TH2 to the high type would only be uh, the, the fixed cost here. Okay, that, that would be different. And so what you earned, uh, RH will always be zero, is just these, these are just the two rectangles I had previously. Okay, and the point is here uh, that in the second period, you get price equal marginal cost. And that's uh, what increases your, your rent as a low type. And of course, delta is important here. Delta is important, the, the, the discount factor. Yeah, and of course, yeah, that's what I already told you. It's optimal to set uh, the rent of the high type equal to zero. It's optimal to set the price of the low type equal to uh, its cost. And uh, it's always optimal to induce truth telling. And that means uh, uh, you want the IC constraint to buy. And welfare, uh, I, I just uh, don't go through the detail here. This is just our, our standard welfare we have uh, here just with, with a second period. Okay, uh, similar as always, only here rent in the two stages, uh, excuse me, welfare in the two stages, and here the rents you have to pay. And the first period is completely like Per Meyerson, that's uh, w what we have. And the second period is just Loeb Magat, and where you just have price equal marginal cost. But this is, uh, this is, is, is just not optimal if the weight, unless the weight of the uh, profits or the rent of the firm is, is one in the uh, social welfare function. Okay. Uh, this looks a bit ugly, but uh, actually it's straightforward, and you will see that in our uh, in our problem in the in the tutorial class. Because the only thing you do here is just add uh, a second period, and where you already know know uh, that price is equal marginal cost. Okay, and the important point here that is, and that's you see that already from the two rectangles, is that the the firm's profit is higher than under commitment, and that's you see why full commitment has the two small green rectangles and therefore it's optimal to have a bear myerson policy in two, uh, in two uh, periods. Uh, what you could also do is, uh, as you see that it's really uh, expensive in terms of uh, the second period rent, you might uh, say, oh, I just don't want to learn what this type is. Okay, of course, this is only relevant if the second period, for instance, is much longer than the first period. Suppose you you make uh, you 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 uh, invite tender offers for, for or you you have some you uh, you have some some uh, railway project and you have uh, initial period of five years and then a second period of fifteen years. Okay, and perhaps you don't want uh, to learn anything uh, in the initial period, just that you don't have to pay so much uh, in the second period. Okay, and. Uh, 
So if you have pooling in the first period, both firms are of the same first period contract, and that means just price equal marginal cost, and price would be equal to the high uh, type, okay? Uh, and in the second period, you have the bear myerson policy, okay? So in the in the first period, where you would then actually have uh, the 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 in a sense the uh, in terms of the rent, or oh, I, I just jump back because it takes too long. You would just have in the First period, then uh, the, the red rectangle. Remember the large, and in the second period, uh, the green rectangle. Uh, and uh, you don't get uh, truthful revelation in the first period. But if the first period is much shorter than the second, uh, this might make sense. And again, we have a very straightforward problem on that, and you can calculate that, and hopefully uh, then uh, it will be clearer. The point is here: second period is small, uh, is bare Myerson, and first period is suboptimal. And if delta is small, uh, if delta is one, for instance, uh, close to so that above or close to one or 0.9, that both uh, periods are similar in length. Uh, it does make sense, but if delta is large, say two or three, a pool because the second period is much longer, pooling contracts might make sense. A price highs optimum is complex, uh, but the point is that uh, it's always a problem if you do not have or if you have an inability not to renegotiate. Uh, the firm can use that that you cannot commit, and therefore it's harder to uh, uh, satisfy the constraint. And uh, so here, what, what the last sentence, what Armstrong and Seppington write, is that it's hard to think of how you could overcome this renegotiation problem, what kind of institutional ways uh, that uh, would serve that. In particular, in democracies, you've seen in Berlin and in Hamburg, they had decisions by, uh, by, the, by popular vote that uh, they want to get back their electricity companies, their uh, distribution network, their water company, and so on. Uh, in, in a democracy, it's always hard. Yeah, f the last point is uh, what happens if there is no commitment? Actually, this is the very same uh, case as, as uh, uh, or very similar to the renegotiation case. The only point is now, if you know you're expropriated of the period one, you only enter or you only, so you're not get paid any rent in period two. Uh, you know you only reveal your type if you get uh, paid all the rent in period one, okay? But then we get a very interesting uh, thing because then uh, you get paid in period one, a very high transfer, and that can lead the high cost firm to claim it's a low cost firm, collect the large first period transfer, and then do not produce uh, in the second period. They just would go bankrupt in the second period. La Forte all call that take the money and rent strategy. Okay? Uh, that, that's uh, what, what is really uh, interesting. You say you want to do these building projects, but you, you get a, a, lot, a lot of money in the first period and you do it at, at very low cost, but you get a high initial uh, payment and then you just go bankrupt and uh, go away. Okay, general principles, uh, separating contracts require high rents to be paid to the low firm. First period pooling is very costly. Okay, uh, and uh, the point is that Inability to comment is, is bad for regulators and it's, it's good for, for firms. And that's, that's a bad thing. That's why uh, every, or many economists uh, stress that it's important to commit. And this holds even more uh, once it, it comes to investment in, in uh, irreversible uh, assets. Okay. Okay, uh, I think I make another break here. Uh, took me longer than expected, but anyway, make a short break before I go back to uh, or to go forward to the next chapter on moral hazard. Okay, also break now, but just one minor comment here. I said it's always difficult in democracies. What I meant here was, of course, it's difficult if you have really a strict majority rule in a sense, which uh, doesn't allow for protection of, say, say minorities or something like that. What you typically have in countries like, like Germany or well-developed uh, democracies that you have uh, protection of minorities and in particular you have some institutional or even constitutional uh, guarantees which uh, protect either your, 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 your property rights and so on. Okay. So the problem is not the democracy, but the problem might be the majority rule if uh, taken to the extreme. Okay, just uh, moving to WebEx for questions. Okay, we move on to the last part of today, moral hazard. Okay, before I move on, uh, I, I just have to reiterate that this is really hard stuff uh, and uh, I do not expect you to understand that immediately and in particular you also should not expect to understand that once you hear it for the first time. Uh, it should become clear uh, once you go over it again and in particular once you solve for the problems uh, in the problem set 
Okay, then it should become clearer, uh, but it's really uh, complicated. And this uh, will as well hold for uh, the next chapter we turn to, the regulation under, under moral hazard, the second uh, set of asymmetric information problem. And uh, I will uh, introduce it right now again, uh, as the whole part of, of this course, uh, or this whole second part, starting from chapter 8.1, uh, this draws on uh, the, the handbook article by Mark Armstrong and David Zeppington uh, in the handbook of industrial organization. I used some slides of uh, Mark Armstrong here and, and uh, adjusted them uh, accordingly and not implying anything, any responsibility on Mark Armstrong's side. But uh, what, what you really should do is you should also look into this paper uh, or that, that article. I try to, to boil it down in a sense and you will see uh, how well uh, this worked. Okay, so what is now our asymmetric information problem? Uh, the problem is that now the firms uh, or in the previous adverse selection setup, it was some characteristic which was exogenous about this, the, the regulator was not informed, okay? Is the firm a high type firm, a high cost firm, or is it a low cost firm? And the firm couldn't do anything, it just was of this type, or has it high uh, demand or low demand? Now it's different because now uh, the firm, is, so there's only one type of firm, but the question is, did this firm or this manager work hard or not work hard? Did they undertake, undertake some, some effort and not? And the point is here, this effort, in particular, this cost reducing effort is not observable. And uh, even though you can uh, observe what, what the state is afterwards, you can observe whether it's a high or a low cost firm, okay? But you don't know uh, whether it's a high cost because the, f the, the managers didn't work hard or whether it's high cost because we had some uh, adverse environment, okay? And what, what, the what, what the firm does really, it chooses the probability phi at which the state is L. If it works harder, the probability is higher that we get a good state, okay? And of course, uh, the point is working harder implies that you have cost in Germany, would have Arbeitsleid. And this is increasing uh, and convex. The harder you have to work, the more is your marginal, the higher is your marginal negative utility from working. Okay. And uh, the point is that the regulator cannot observe uh, how hard this worked, so it, uh, how hard of the, the firm worked, uh, but it can observe the state. The point is also, of course, even though the managers uh, don't work hard, uh, they might have a good state. Okay. Because of, yeah. Uh, just uh, in, in case of, of one of the favorite or, or leading examples of this kind of, of theory, uh, we have uh, a tenant uh, who who uh, cultivates some land and uh, even though the tenant works not hard, he might get a good uh, harvest because the weather is so good, okay? Uh, I think I also have some, some other examples here. Uh, the demand of a regulated firm uh, might depend on its effort. Just think uh, on, on, on the railways, okay, uh, whether Deutsche Bahn or HLB uh, works hard, uh, or, or put it differently, uh, the number of pa passengers you get in trains might depend on how hard uh, the, the railway companies work, what, how good the service is. You can only observe as a public transport authority typically the number of passengers you have, but really hard for you uh, to look into how good uh, or hard they worked in terms of the service, whether breakdowns uh, were due to some external force or uh, to, to lacks in, in, in maintenance or something like that, okay? I hope that this satisfied, uh, satisfy or, or, or is sufficient for uh, to give you some idea. Okay, now the point here, or our next point is here that now we really have uncertainty. We have an uncertain outcome and therefore we have to look into uh, utilities uh, because we have to take into account uh, attitudes toward risk, uh, like, like risk aversion, risk loving or risk neutrality. Okay, and uh, the, the point is here, uh, it's always uncertain what the outcome will be. Even if you work hard, you might have a bad outcome. If you don't work, you might have a good outcome. And uh, since uh, we allow for risk aversion, not only for risk neutrality here, uh, we have to introduce uh, some, some expected utility and, uh, yeah, and, and take into account these utilities and not only the rents. And uh, uh, what does this mean? So if you have uh, here some utility, so this would be the participation constraint of the firm, uh, you get with a certain probability you end up in, in, the, in the low state, with the converse probability you end up in a high state, and given on the transfers you're paying and on the prices which are set, you have a certain utility in this stage and another utility in the high stage, and of course you have this cost of effort. And the participation constraint simply states that uh, your utility you receive here uh, in, in this occupation has to be at least as high as in any alternative uh, you might get. Okay, this is your reservation 
uh, utility. Okay, and uh, because uh, we have to deal so much with the utilities uh, in case of uncertainty, I just make a very short digression here on, uh, on, uh, to, to choice under uncertainty, uh, to what is called expected utility theory. Uh, that's what we are using. We are actually using here the von Neumann Morgenstern uh, utility function. And uh, this is rather straightforward. And just if you don't know that, go to your uh, intermediate uh, textbook, like the Varian uh, Intermediate Microeconomics or something like that. You might also look into a more advanced treatment like Maskolel, Winston Green. Okay, and you will see it all starts from a lottery where a lottery is really a simple lottery. You have some outcome X, say you, you earn nothing with some probability alpha and you earn uh, 100 euros with the converse probability one minus alpha. And this lottery is simply written as L uh, as a function of the outcomes and the probability. And the expected utility theory implies that you really can uh, have the utility or that you can uh, describe the utility from this lottery as simply the expected utility of the utility from each of the outcomes. This is, uh, so this U of X is really the von Neumann Morgenstern uh, utility function, uh, which, which puts uh, the attitudes towards risk uh, simply in this utility function, okay? It's cap captured in a utility function over these monetary outcomes, okay? Here would just, just be utility of zero and utility of 100. And uh, you will see what, what we get here. And uh, there's a lot of discussion and uh, it has been shown that this really uh, doesn't fit uh, perfectly or I would say not, not very well uh, with, with real behavior, but uh, uh, it, it's really good to use and that's why we are using it. And uh, given this uh, von Neumann Morgenstern utility, uh, we can introduce concepts like risk aversion, which just simply means that utility from getting something for sure here, the expected value of the utility uh, for sure is, uh, gives you a higher utility than getting the lottery. Uh, if you are risk averse, we will define the certainty equivalent that is the amount of money that uh, uh, makes the individual indifferent between participating in the lottery and, and taking the money and the risk premium, which is just the difference between the expected value of the lottery uh, and the certain uh, certainty equivalent. I just want to illustrate here uh, in, with the help of these diagrams. Here you have risk loving or risk beha uh, preferring behavior. Uh, here you have risk neutrality. And uh, in this case here, uh, I just want to explain in more detail uh, risk aversion. Risk aversion has this concave uh, utility function where the, the, the second uh, derivative uh, is, is negative. Now suppose you have some lottery with some probability uh, alpha and, and one minus alpha. You know here uh, these, these hopefully you see this dashed line. Uh, this, this is just a convex combination which has all the two outcomes with certain probabilities ranging from alpha, if alpha is a probability and one minus I of R and, and one minus alpha is a probability of B, uh, of B, it would be just all combinations if you uh, change alpha from one to, to, to zero. And if alpha is equal to one half, that's what we are just looking at this here. Here you get what risk aversion means. If you get uh, this uh, value one half alpha, uh, one half a plus one half b for certain, your utility would be higher than, uh, this is what is this here, okay? Your utility would be higher than if you get the lottery because then you just get one half ua plus one half ub, okay? That's risk aversion. What we have here is the certainty equivalent. So uh, the, this is uh, just the utility from the lottery would be just here, okay? And uh, uh, so you, from this, you, you get this here, and the same lottery uh, it, you get if you get certainly or a certain payment of CE. Okay, this would be the certainty equivalent, and of course the difference is just the risk premium here. So this would be, um, I have trouble here this, to denote this. This would be just the risk premium. Okay, and of course uh, you see here also uh, that with with uh, risk neutrality, it all doesn't matter, okay? Uh, you are happy with, you are as happy with the lottery as long as it is fair as with a certain uh, payment. And uh, in, in terms of uh, risk loving behavior, you even, um, I have trouble here to, to connect these uh, two points with a straight line here. Uh, but you see here, uh, you would prefer the lottery because you have the chance to earn uh, a lot, okay? So this, this is what we do. Uh, is there anything in the notes? No. Okay, Th that's what we have. And hopefully you know that, but that's what we will use a lot. And actually here, what you see uh, in, in, in what follows, I will use uh, a simple, a, a simple uh, utility function. This is meant to be a square root sign. Hopefully you can, you can 
read that, okay? Square root of the monetary outcomes. So W is just some monetary outcome, like some, some B could be 100 or 90 and A could be 10 or something. like that. That's what we are doing. Okay, yeah, now, now we can start with our problem and uh, the, the problem with moral hazard is really strange in a sense because previous you, uh, in, in, in adverse selection model you saw you had two types and of type one we had to satisfy the participation constraint and of ty type two we had to satisfy the incentive compatibility constraint. Now we have to satisfy both of this single type, both the participation constraint and the incentive compatibility constraint at the same time. Unless uh, we get a rent, but here you will see uh, we, we will try to incentivize the firm uh, by some difference between uh, the, the rent in the high, and that's the utility in a good state and the utility in a bad state. And we, we can always then make sure that it doesn't earn more uh, than, than its uh, reservation utility. Okay, so a starting point here uh, is uh, how would a firm, how hard would a firm, how hard would managers work given uh, the, the, the regulator uh, pays them a certain or, or guarantees them a certain utility. And of course, you saw previously, uh, just on the previous slide, uh, it can just guarantee a certain utility by paying a certain transfer. Okay, and what you see here is the optimization problem. Given the contract specifying that you get UL in, in state L and UH in state H. Okay, and uh, you simply maximize phi times UL plus one minus phi times UH minus your cost. And this is really straightforward. This is what is called the incentive compatibility constraint. That's what you will see uh, in, really in, in, in the next two steps here, because the first order condition would be just take the derivative with respect to phi. You, so FOC is just UL minus UH minus D prime of phi, okay? Equal to zero, okay? And uh, the point is here, uh, and here's just rearrange. Uh, the point is how hard would you work as a manager if UL is equal to UH? You don't get anything more uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you work hard, if, if the state is better. And what you're doing is uh, with, with working harder, you increase the probability. So the point is here, uh, you see already that if we set UL equal to UH, we might have tr trouble incentivizing this firm because uh, the, the, the firm or the manager don't have an uh, incentive to work hard. And therefore, this uh, difference in, 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 in uh, utilities, uh, depending on the state we are in, is called delta U, or it's denoted as delta U, and it's called the power of the incentive scheme. Okay? Uh, for a Beamte, for a civil servant, uh, in, in uh, most parts of, of the public bureaucracy, uh, you, get, uh, you get the same payment irrespective of whether you work hard or not. Okay? And at least that was some discussion. Of course, uh, many uh, Beamte, many civil servants will be intrinsically motivated, but those who, who are not, uh, there might be trouble because you don't uh, have a powerful incentive scheme. Okay? Uh, and the optimal effort, uh, given you have this uh, first order condition, you just can solve for the optimal effort, uh, and you know that the optimal effort phi star will be a function of the power of the incentive scheme. And uh, in, in our simple case we consider here, uh, we can simply use this uh, first order condition uh, in uh, order to, or, or as an incentive compatibility constraint. Uh, it's more complicated if we would have a continuum uh, of, of, of uh, possible states, but uh, not here. Okay, so it should become clear. We will also have a, a very uh, straightforward uh, problem in the problem set where you just give, or, or actually I can just uh, show you that uh, right here. So what what you see here uh, is just ch how how such a such a function could look like here. Okay, and uh, you will just calculate then, given this function, the optimal uh, probability which the firm chooses. Okay, that that's what you can do, just as an example. And uh, so the, now the point is that the regulator directly knows if uh, she. Uh, provides a certain power of the incentive scheme, a certain difference uh, between the utilities, a certain delta u, we get a certain probability phi. Then, of course, the regulator has uh, to maximize uh, total welfare, and in this case here is expected consumer surplus. You will see that uh, the participation constraint will typically be satisfied with equality, and therefore the welfare of the or the utility of the firm is uh, not higher as in, in any outside opportunity. Now, 
uh, how does expected consumer surplus look like? If the firm is given utility UI in state I, the maximum consumer surplus can be put as, uh, as a function of UI. So uh, the, the, the regulator maximizes V uh, equal, uh, again, it's just the expected value here. We assume that consumers are, uh, in a sense, risk neutral here because there are so many consumers uh, and they are, have a diversified portfolio, in a sense, uh, so, so that it uh, doesn't matter if you have to pay one euro more or less here. Okay. Now, uh, this is, of course, very unusual, but it's really powerful, as we, you will uh, see in hindsight. It's uh, rather straightforward, and I think I just uh, sketched that very briefly, uh, how that looks like. Uh, so just to make uh, clear to you uh, how we get uh, this, this strange kind of VU, and therefore I, I go here. So what uh, I just showed you, for instance, was that uh, U, U might be just equal to square root R, okay, R. And you know that, uh, that just to, to just draw this, this would then be R, our monetary outcome, this would be U, and you would have a nice... So, I don't know whether this is really uh, the square root function, but uh, it, it, it should be clear. It should be clear that this is is then uh, just a risk neutral uh, firm. Okay. And now, how do you get uh, this? Because this is not a risk neutral. This would be a risk averse firm. Okay. V of u. Okay. That v i of u. I in this stage. How do you how do you get that? Now you know that R is nothing else than I, I just skip the I here. Oh, I just uh, okay minus uh, plus T I. Okay, that's our standard. And if we know that U uh, is just square root R uh, from U equals square root R, we know that R is equal than U squared. Okay, so uh, if we now we know you know what, what is consumer surplus. Consumer surplus is just here our standard net consumer surplus minus the T I pay in this, uh, in, minus the transfer I pay in this situation. Okay, that's our consumer surplus. But here uh, we can solve for the TI, which is nothing else than, excuse me here, RI minus pi I. Okay, and I'm cheating a bit here. Uh, and, and therefore, if we substitute this up here or down here, uh, we get Ti is nothing else than uh, u squared minus pi i. Okay, and therefore our vi, our our we call this s, okay, S uh, surplus of the consumers. Now we uh, use a slightly different notation. This is a capital V here, uh, and uh, vi pi we get minus u squared plus pi i. The nice thing here again, uh, you have total surplus and you get total surplus minus this uh, utility square. And what you will see later on here, uh, this total surplus, this V of UI here will be a concave function, will be a concave function of UI, I should note here. Because concave, if you take the second derivative, if you take the first derivative, you get uh, minus two uh, UI and then you get minus two is a second derivative, so you get a concave function. Okay, so this is just, uh, or uh, this should just uh, make clear to you what this V of U is. So it's nothing special, nothing complicated. It's just that we uh, take into account that here uh, reservation, uh, excuse me, rent is not equal to utility uh, because we have uh, risk uh, aversion. Okay, and then uh, we assume that uh, our social planner, our regulator maximizes V. Okay, and uh, of course the regulator has to take into account first of all the incentive compatibility constraint here in terms of the first order condition and the opt or the optimal uh, optimal uh, probability as a function of the power of the of the incentive scheme of the LTU and the participation constraint. Uh, Armstrong Sepping, yeah, and if this PC binds, if this participation constraint binds, uh, then it just means that U is equal to uh, to U uh, zero. Okay, and uh, uh, at least Armstrong Sepping think it's it's good to put that then in terms of the expected social surplus v plus u minus u zero. This would be then a social surplus. This would be a constant, which doesn't matter in the in the in the derivation anyway. And further on, uh, we assume simply that u zero uh, is is norm normalized as as being as being zero. And then we get our 
slightly uh, different uh, problem because now uh, we have here this uh, phi of, of uh, WL, which is, oh, I think I have to uh, give you this notation here. Uh, we get then the U uh, with some probability. And uh, of course, uh, I probably should jump back here uh, because uh, otherwise you, you don't understand how we get this. The, what we are using here is, if I manage to get this, is just this here, U. Uh, what, what we have used is this u here, okay? And you see this is phi ul plus one minus phi uh minus d phi. And this is equal to uh, our outside opportunity or our reservation utility, okay? And that's what we are using here. And that's why we, we get this phi, uh, which is nothing, uh, phi uh, ul of ul plus uh, one minus phi uh uh minus d of phi. That's what we get here, okay? Uh, and this is our optimization problem. We could also do with this here, okay? Uh, wouldn't matter, but uh, you will see a little bit later that uh, it gives uh, nicer, nicer uh, terms. Uh, I think uh, I, I, as time ran out anyway, uh, and, and as this is uh, hard to digest also, uh, I will not show you the full information outcome right now because I learned that we have sufficient time anyway, I guess. Uh, and uh, just uh, briefly, uh, you see it's ugly, so uh, I, I couldn't do it in, 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 a, in a, uh, say, the next two or three minutes. Here's uh, your optimization problem, and I will move on next time here. But uh, I just want to give you a preview in the results, and the results will be uh, that the utility, or that this is, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, what, what the marginal utility uh, here uh, or the marginal rate of, sub, of the consumer surplus as a function here of the firm's utility is the same in both states. And that's a very general result that uh, in a full information outcome where we know the type and how hard uh, uh, the, these managers work, uh, we will uh, perfectly or completely ensure uh, these, these firm and will have uh, the same uh, the, the, the same utility uh, in both states. The firm would bear no risk. And you already see that uh, full information is, is, or the full information outcome is not a good outcome in, uh, in, in under adverse selection because uh, what are the effects uh, here? How hard would, would the manager work if it doesn't get anything more, uh, if it works hard compared to if it doesn't work hard, okay? Okay, I think I uh, leave it at this here. Okay, I uh, thank you and hope that it wasn't too hard uh, as already, uh, Noted, uh, this is uh, com uh, complex uh, uh, stuff and, and uh, you have to be a bit patient and uh, to go through it probably uh, at least two times and in particular then also prepare, uh, prepare uh, the, the problems for the tutorial class and then it should uh, become clear hopefully. Uh, I thank you here. I will move on with this topic uh, on next Thursday and uh, we will meet again in the tutorial class on Tuesday. Thank you for uh, being with me and uh, as always I will be available briefly for questions on Redux. Bye. Okay, we are almost done. Uh, on the previous slide I once mentioned adverse selection uh, so that it's the problem if you have this kind of uh, full uh, full, uh, complete insurance under uh, adverse selection. Of course it's under asymmetric information because here we are in a moral hazard uh, scenario. Okay, yeah, that's it. So we will move on next week according to our schedule as usual on, on Thursday with our uh, lecture and I wish you a good week and again um, here available for for uh, some WebEx uh, discussions and be sure to prepare uh, the assignment well uh, because it's rather important that you get this Baron Myers reports uh, we did on Tuesday, uh, where, where you really understand it. Okay, so goodbye.